tuning in from. Good afternoon and good evening. My name is Gideon Orbach. I practice chiropractic here at the World of Wellness. I'm closing in on 16 years at this location, closing in on 22 years from my career. I'm uh, just getting warmed up. So I'm going to get a chance now to talk to you all about uh, some of the really cool things that I've been up to and some of the really cool things that I do and the cool things that I've learned and the cool things I can do to help you out. Anyhow, as I, as I mentioned, I practice chiropractic. I hold the, uh, the distinction of also being a primary, scare, primary, primary spinal practitioner, a certification from the University of Pittsburgh, which is near and dear to my heart. For those of you that don't know me, I bleed blue and gold. Um, I'm a proud Pitt alum, and I hold a, um, an important professional credential from the University of Pittsburgh. And I started here. Oh, I should back up a second. I went to chiropractic school in Kansas City, Missouri. I, I very sarcastically refer to that as my four-year business trip to Kansas City. Uh, uh, it was a great experience being out there. So I started with Dr. Weiner in uh, 2007. We were on the south side of Pittsburgh in a building that exuded character. And uh, we were there, well, he was there for quite a while. I was practiced with him for a little over a year. Then we moved to this building here in Green Tree, which is one of the southern suburbs of Pittsburgh. Uh, we've been here since 2008. Um, when we moved here, the practice, the business was renamed the uh, Weiner Wellness Center. And then, uh, uh, as everybody I'm sure knows, Dr. Weiner passed in uh, 2017. And when Jamie Dorley took over the business, it was uh, renamed to the World of Wellness. So we're we're essentially the um, the same business. We're doing some of the same things with more uh, more modalities, upgraded nutritional supplements, but the the same model that we've been doing for um, all these years. It all holds place. So. As I, um, as I mentioned, I practice chiropractic, and I, I practice with my mind and my hands and occasionally an elbow. I do uh, some trigger point muscle therapy release techniques. I certainly wouldn't hold myself up to being called a trigger point specialist the way uh, uh, past people who have worked here had, such as uh, Jacob, for those of you that remember him, Adam and Andrea and Herman. They did trigger point therapy as a modality, as a standalone modality. I use my trigger point therapy to go into the sauce that I call a chiropractic treatment, which also includes uh, a neurological stretching technique called PNF stretching, proprioceptive neurofacilitated, which, which means that it's a partner stretch that I do for my patients. It's not something that you can do for yourself. And we take advantage of neurological reflexes in order to allow patients to stretch further and gain more range of motion, more flexibility than they could achieve on their own. Uh, of course, I do the chiropractic adjustments. I use my hands. I mean, some chiropractors use instruments or devices. We're talking about the quick impulse maneuver, specifically to open up joint spaces. Sometimes you hear a popping noise. I love that noise. Some of the, uh, uh, some of the best adjustments are actually pretty quiet ones, though. But I do love that popping noise. I do low-tech uh, rehab. Low-tech rehab means that we do exercises that involve using your body in certain positions and certain movements. I might ask you to use something so complicated as ice, maybe a shower towel, uh, things that you really should be able to have at home. If not, we'll find one for you. But as I mentioned, we're upgrading here. We do some new stuff too. We do some high-tech rehab. Uh, um, I have a, a colleague, Dr. Philip Ross, he, well, I do too, but more so he than I. He uses a, a therapeutic laser. Uh, we have uh, a vibration machine. We have an infrared sauna. We have pneumatic compression boots. These are all what are called high-tech rehab. They entail equipment, things that you, um, you got to come here to use the equipment, not stuff that you would do at home. Uh, and I also do condition-specific rehab. I mean, I'm sorry, condition-specific nutrition. So we have patients who come in, our population uh, uh, comes for nutrition. And if somebody, for example, has uh, uh, a systemic organic problem due to a nutrition deficiency, they would probably want to see my colleague, Jeffrey Nisnik, or uh, our new uh, nutritionist, Alicia. Um, if somebody has, uh, for example, neuromusculoskeletal injuries, a sprain strain of their shoulder, spinal discomfort, 
uh, um, rehabbing a sprained ankle. That's, that's where I excel. So anyhow, those are, those are the things that I, that I do. And, and I'm very lucky. I'm, I practice, uh, the way I've been trained when, uh, when I was in chiropractic school and to this day, I, I continue to use the same battery of maneuvers and the same guiding principles uh, and the same general clinical strategies as I was doing as a beginning student intern back in uh, 2000. And I would say that the reason for that is because I'm the beneficiary of such extraordinary mentorship. I owe so much, so much gratitude to the people who trained me to think like a clinician to practice like a clinician and to explain what I do like a clinician and, and to treat patients like they really matter. They, they, you're not just, you're not a number. You're not some arbitrary name on my schedule uh, when you come here. And, and this is the guidance that I've received from people like uh, Mark King, who owns and operates the Motion Palpation Institute. Um, Ken Erickson, who owns and operates General Systems Neurology. Uh, Ted Carrick, a name that maybe some of you remember, he was Sidney Crosby's chiropractor when uh, Sidney Crosby was having his concussions in uh, 20, in the early 2000s, early 2010-ish. Um, I did a lot of training in extremity adjusting from uh, Dr. Mark Charette. Dr. Mark Charette is so good at what he does and such a good teacher and such a good adjuster that he was teaching a workshop in Australia and the Australian Chiropractic Society gave him license to practice, which means that now I, I don't know in today's climate why anybody would want to immigrate to Australia, but there's a, a lot of paperwork and a lot of red tape and, and a lot of I's to dot and T's to cross, uh, and it's complicated. And then, then you have to worry about getting a work visa. Well, this guy, my, my direct mentor, is such a good chiropractor that the Australian chiropractic community basically eliminated all of that red tape and said, if you, if you want to come here and practice, all you really have to do is sign up for a work visa and they're going to put one in your hands. I, I think that's a pretty big deal because we're chiropractors. My heroes don't appear on picture stamps or postage stamps, um, but we're making our way in the world doing exciting stuff. As I, as I mentioned, I was part of the University of Pittsburgh's primary spinal practitioner program, which is the first program of its kind in that it assimilated chiropractic, physical therapy, and uh, the practice of osteopathy, uh, um, osteopath doctors who do manipulations and adjustments were all eligible for this training and certification. And, and to be frank with you, in 2018, 2019, I knew, I knew there were some holes in my game. I was missing a few things that I wanted to make sure that I learned and uh, put into my bag of tricks. And that's what motivated me to do this program. And when I got there, like with any program, the real magic occurs at the lunch break and in the hallways between lecture breaks and after class when you're networking with your colleagues and you're networking with some of the instructors. And you know we, we go through the curriculum and you look, you gotta read the book. You got to take notes in the lecture. You got to pass the test. That's, that's all there is to it. I, I can't break it down any simpler than that. But the chance to network and to teach and to learn from 50, 100 different professional colleagues who all see a similar group of patients and a similar group of complaints and a similar group of symptomatic challenges, and yet they all have their own specific mechanism as how do, how do I address this? And if you had the same patient walking into your office, how would you address it? That's, that was the magic of being involved in this program. And one of the things that my, my friend and mentor, Mark Charette, told me at the, at the very beginning when I was in my first year of chiropractic school and, and I met him for one of the first times and we were just kind of talking to each other and I was figuring out is this program for me and he was figuring out is this guy for me and are we going to be a good match to work together and and one of the things he told me was you want to be the chiropractor adjusting chiropractors in front of other chiropractors you can't fake those people out you can't you can't bs your way through uh, a treatment with a professional colleague with a dozen other professional colleagues watching back checking you, asking questions as you go along. So that, uh, that program at, uh, the, at Pitt, the PSP certification program, I, I adjusted 
dozens of chiropractors and physical therapists with other chiropractors and physical therapists watching and asking questions. And basically, I, I was doing for them exactly what I do for, oh, 100% of my patients in the treatment room. These are the maneuvers that I use. These are the principles that I employ. These are the questions that I ask. These are the, the uh, symptoms that I look for. These are the combinations of tightnesses and patterns that I look for. And, and so it was kind of exciting and validating and, and uh, um, a really good experience to be able to say, this is what I do every day in practice. What, you do something different? Don't you do this? Are you kidding me? So that was a little, that was a little ego inflating for me, those moments. And, um, I, you know, I like to share my ego inflating moments with anybody who will listen. So that brings us to a very important question. Why, why would anybody want this? Why would you want a chiropractor to put his or her hands on your body and press on you and twist you and challenge your muscles and force your joints or coax your joints to open and close beyond their normal ranges of motion. What kind of a normal person does this as a profession? And what kind of a normal person would want this done to their bodies? My God, what's wrong with all of us? Anyhow, the point of this workshop is to answer that question, to explain to you exactly what it is that I'm doing, exactly why it is that I'm doing this, and how it can benefit you in the most profound ways but before, before we start with that deep dive, let's do this. As, as I mentioned, one of the things that I really like and I really want to add to as much of the patient clinical experience as I possibly can is low-tech rehab. Low-tech rehab means we're using our bodies as a piece of equipment and we're positioning ourselves in a way that it might be challenging. Uh, um, we're not taking a, a two-hour break in the day to drive over to the gym and work out and hire a trainer and shower and make our way home through rush hour traffic. I mean, look, if you're that person, don't let me stop you. I encourage that. But that's not what it takes to do rehab in my, my worldview. So one of the most important rehab principles is that we got we to gotta breathe better. If we're going to have something that we're all universally really upset about, we're going to protest. We're going to march in the streets and protest. Some of us are going to go on a hunger strike. It might last a couple days. i will be a little worn out and dragging and suffering from some low blood sugar. But you can fast for a day or two. So if you want to go on a hunger strike, be my guest. It'll clear your mind. Some of us are going to go on a thirst strike. Not going to last as long as the hunger strike, people. But if you go a day without drinking, it'll, it'll cost you. But you could do it. Some of us are going to have the brave idea that are going to say, oh, I'm just going to hold my breath until I get what I want. How long do you think those people are going to last? <laughs> Not going to work out for them. I'm here to tell you that in terms of making ourselves healthy and rehabbing injuries and rehabbing illnesses, and as I, as I stand here in a building that contains one of the most state-of-the-art nutrition stores, the best products in all the land, all pharmaceutical grade, made by, produced by companies that have been well-referenced, well-studied, that are held to the highest standard. I'm still going to stand firm and tell you the most important thing you can put into your body is oxygen. You have to breathe. So what we're going to do as part of low-tech rehab exercise, number one, is we're going to do some deep breathing. And what I want is for everybody who's join me here in the crowd. And if you're sitting at home watching on Facebook or YouTube or whatever other platforms that we might be on that I'm not aware of, please indulge me and join in. If you're driving and you just have this going as background noise, keep your eyes on the road and focus on what you're doing, please. If you're operating heavy, dangerous equipment, watch the video and do this with us later. So what I want everybody to do is sit up as straight and tall as they possibly can in posture that would impress their chiropractor. So we want to imagine a string coming down from the ceiling, attaching to the top of our heads. Now, when we go to get our height measured, we all want to be that eighth of an inch taller than we are. And we're trying to reach our heads up to the ceiling, right? So we're, all right, let's go, let's go double down on that eighth and make it eight inches taller than we really are. 
Okay, so so we're reaching our heads up to the ceiling, and I want you to think about the tallest point at the top of your head, and that's going to be we're going to stretch that up to the top of the ceiling. All right, so good. Now we're going to take our shoulder blades and we're just going to roll them backwards and let them sink down. So we're not shrugging our shoulders up, but we're forcing our shoulders down in a comfortable, relaxed position. And then we want to take the section of our abdomen. If you go to your belt buckle or where your belt buckle might lie, and the bottom of your rib cage, you have this little um, little piece of cartilage called the xiphoid process. It's a really tender piece on most people and a little, little triangular shape at the bottom of your chest, the bottom of your sternum, the top of your abdomen. And we're going to take that space between the belt buckle and the xiphoid process, and we're going to make as much, we're going to go as long and as tall as possible as we can in that region. Our shoulders are still thrown back, our head is still up, and you should feel kind of comfortable and relaxed in this position because you're using your body in its maximal mechanically advantaged position. I'm not going to slump forward and have these muscles in the front of my uh, my top of my chest, the bottom of my neck here, pulling my chin in and shortening. No, they're in a good, comfortable, relaxed position. I'm not leaning off to my left or to my right, putting undue stress on my pelvis on one way or the other and disrupting that, what's called a kinematic chain, a movement chain of muscles, joints, connective tissue. I am in a body aligned, comfortable position with my shoulders back and down. I'm long in the abdomen, my head is upright, and I am going to take a deep breath in through my nose keeping my torso as still as possible, feeling my chest and lungs and abdomen expanding outwards as I inflate like a balloon. I'm going to hold it for 1,001, 1,002. Let's do 1,003 for good measure. And now I'm going to blow out through my mouth and my abdomen is going to sink in. Let's do that again. Big, deep breath in through your nose, inflating like a balloon. We're not shrugging our shoulders. Our shoulders remain relaxed in a down position. You can do this standing. Good. And we're holding. And we're holding some more. And we're holding again. And let's blow out through our mouths. Let's do this one last time. Big, deep breath in through your nose. We're holding, we're holding some more. Let's hold again, hold again, and blow out through your mouths. All right, first of all, the people who are, I, I guess my question is really for the people who are in this room who are indulging me, but if you're out in Facebook land and you want to comment, this is interactive. You guys feel a little relaxed? Like your body feel like it's slowed down just a little bit? Oh, we got a universal head nod. I love it. Universal head nod. All right, so check this out. I get, uh, you know, I do this workshop once or twice every wellness week. We have what four or five wellness, five wellness weeks a year at this point. I just got done telling you I'm on year six, closing in on year 16 at the World of Wellness Weiner Wellness Center Pain Release Center. So let, let's do some math. We've done this a lot. <laughs> Okay, every single workshop I've done, we've done some group deep breathing activity. And I'm gonna tell you guys something else that uh, um, you might not know about me. I teach other things in other places that have absolutely nothing to do with chiropractic and natural health. Guess what we do as part of our workshop when we're talking about other things that don't involve chiropractic and natural health? We do some deep breathing exercise. And you know what? I talk to uh, a class at uh, Butler Community College. I've talked to uh, an economics class at um, IUP. And you know what? These classes are like, there's no Zoom, there's no Facebook Live. There's just, if you come to class, you're in the room, you get to hear me and participate. You don't want to participate, don't participate. It doesn't cost me anything. This is here for your benefit. So I might be in a room of 50, 80, even as many as 100 people. And we're doing, you know, we're here to talk about something about like the economics of healthcare and things that people can be looking to do if they want to get into the business of healthcare and how it affects me. And we stop and we do these deep breathing exercises. And guess what? Nearly universal head nod there, too. It's kind of cool to see 50 people in a classroom going, yeah, I felt I, well, here's a radical idea. Why don't you do this every day? Why, why don't you why don't you take a couple minutes out in the morning and just do some focused deep breathing and take a couple minutes out in the middle of the afternoon and again in the evening and do some deep breathing? Think about how much better and more relaxed you might 
end up being. And as we progress through the workshop, because I promise you, I will get to that. Why do I do this? And what's it all for? And how does it benefit you? Uh, we'll get there, I promise. Um, why, why is this deep breathing not part of your everyday routine? Low tech rehab. Look, there are people who come here looking for help who have a problem with candida, with parasites in their intestines that are making their way into their circulatory system, with sprained ankles, with headaches, with low back pain, with hormonal imbalances. Look, I don't, I don't sit on the panacea. I can't tell you there's a one shot, one kill. We're going to get rid of every single pathology that you know of that you could possibly have with one little exercise. But I can tell you this, you'll be better off if you do the deep breathing exercise. How much equipment did this cost us? Did we have to take a ride to the gym? Do we even have to go downstairs to the spare room? Pretty easy, low tech stuff. You guys all on board with this? All right, I got to introduce my uh, my friend and coworker here, IT savant Phil. Uh, he's in charge of, well, he's an IT savant. He's in charge of the information technology here and the Zoom and the Facebook and the all this and all that. So as I, as I mentioned, all of these workshops that I do, whether it has to do with the economics of healthcare, whether it has to do with personal finance, whether it has to go with growing tomatoes on a hydroponic farm, no, I don't do that chiropractic, wellness, we always do some deep breathing. And for the people who send me Facebook messages later and say, you've done 16 years times five workshops a year times two workshops per workshop, and you always do that deep breathing, my, I mean, do something else. I, we can do other things too, but let me ask you this. Here's my answer. So it must be pretty important if I put that much emphasis on it, huh? Okay. IT Savant Phil, um, has anybody gotten in touch with us through technology, questions, comments, moral outrages. Uh, that's my guy. All right, not yet, but he's gonna let me know. All right, so why do we do this? What are my, what are my clinical goals? What are my motivations? What do I wanna see have happen for my patients? Well, I would venture to guess that not, not 100%, not 100%, but pretty close to it of my new patients come in and they say, they say, well, hi, I'm Gideon Orbach. It's nice to meet you. All right, we're all assembled. What can I do for you? How can I help you? And, and one of their first sentences is, I am in pain. My fill in the blank name body part hurts. And we talk about it, okay? Now, I would like to tell you that I have a magic wand or a super light switch and I can wave it or flip it or do something with it and make everybody's pain go away. I wish I could. I wish it worked like that. But unfortunately, it doesn't. As it, as it turns out, like, look, I work with the public. There are some people, uh, there's a few groups of people, not necessarily here right now, but people who come in to see me, who supply me with the best stories to tell my friends and family. And, and, and if they didn't have such good stories, I really wish they wouldn't come back because the public is, they're tricky, right? They're very tricky to deal with. However, when you think about how many patients I've seen and how few of them fit in that category, my God, am I lucky? I am so lucky to have a clientele of patients that I overwhelmingly like, that I want to go out of my way for, I want to go the extra mile for, I want to flip that switch and wave that magic wand and get them out of pain as soon as humanly possible. My patients are cool people. They're fun. I lucked out. <laughs> I really did, but let's not chase pain around. So let's, let's begin with different motivations. What do I, what do I want for my patients? Well, what, what, can I, what can I realistically do for these people? We want to incre increase ranges of motion. We want to be able to have better flexibility. We want patients to have better posture. We want them to have better breathing mechanics. We want them to have better coordination, better balance. We want them to be able to move their bodies like it's one body working together, not a collection of parts just hurtling their way through space. You guys cool with that? So why is it a mistake to chase pain? Why is it a make mistake to, for me to say to the patient, we're gonna have our hypothetical patient who says, well, Dr. Orbach, my shoulder is killing me. 
Why is it a mistake for me to say, all right, our, our, we're going to get rid of that pain and your shoulder is going to quit killing you? Well, first of all, I, I, I don't know. I just don't know. We're going to do everything we can to make that happen for you. But pain is an individual emotional experience. It's generated by a subjective response to whatever sim stimulus that person has. Now, I wish I could tell you that this was my first patient in practice because it would make for a much better story, but it wasn't. It was somebody I saw many years ago. So, sir, how long has, you, how long has your back hurt you since I was shot in the S-bone? Excuse me? I just heard in the back, somebody asked, what's the S-bone? I heard that. That was, that, was, that, was, that was our longstanding good friend, authority figure person, Kristen Dorley. The fact that she doesn't know what an S-bone is, is not an indictment against everything. Because I didn't know what an S-bone was either when he told me this. He said his ass bone. My man was standing on the street corner. Somebody opened gunfire. A bullet bounced off of the sidewalk lodged itself in his pelvis, and that was when his back started hurting. Can you imagine? <laughs> had, that, had that bullet fragment moved just a little tiny, tiny, barely measurable distance over, it could have killed him. Had it moved a little tiny, tiny distance over the other way, it would have missed him, and he'd have a good story to tell. I mean, that's how random life is. Now, let me ask you this. If, if the best neurosurgeons at UPMC look at this scenario and, and they say, this, this, he's better off having the bullet lodged in his S-bone than us doing surgery to take it out because there are too many delicate neurological and digestive tract structures and blood vessels, and the chances of us creating a bigger problem are too great. Dude's gonna have to live with this. I, I think. No, it was in the it was in the pelvis in the in the issue. Uh, the question was, was it in the tailbone? And and no, it was a little. If this is midline is medial, and we move out to the periphery, this is lateral. So it was probably let's ballpark it at about two inches lateral of the tailbone. Anyhow, how much you think I was able to help him? Your boy got skunked. <laughs> I was unable to help him. I, I, I don't, what can, what can we do? Well, as it turns out, there are things that can be done. There are, there truly are, but chiropractic adjustments are not going to be what gets this guy out of pain because we just simply were not able to account for the destruction of anatomical tissue that uh, uh, continued to send signals into his nervous system. We would have to use entirely different techniques in order to suppress those signals and the way his brain was receiving them. So, no, I can't promise you that I'm going to be that I am going to be able to help everybody get out of pain. I, I'm um, I'm not making that promise, even though that's what brings people in. So, um, during the Civil War. There were soldiers who were injured so badly by shrapnel, cannon fire, gunfire, who knows what, that the, uh, um, the surgeons, unlike my, uh, my patient who I described for you, uh, um, they decided that the best case scenario is let's amputate this person's leg or arm right here on the side of the battlefield in order to prevent future infection. That sounds horrible. It sounds gruesome. It does sound better than developing a systemic infection that kills you slowly. Years later, documented cases of these people who've had a leg amputated tell their physicians that they feel pain in a leg that doesn't even exist. Wow. That's called reflexive sympathetic dystrophy. It's also called phantom pain. It's also called pseudex atrophy. Um, how do you account for that? How, how do you account for that? Well, first of all, we can say for absolute certainty, if you're, if you're feeling pain in a leg that's not there, it has something to do with your nervous system and probably your brain and how you're processing the world around you and your internal environment. It has nothing to do with what your leg is doing because your leg is not there. You guys agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
So our hypothetical patient comes in with excruciating pain at their shoulder. Like, I, I, I don't know what, what kind of circumstances are involved in your life that created this pain in your shoulder. It's very, very possible that you had, uh, um, you bought two cases of chunky soup and each can of soup weighs a pound and you picked one up after the other and reached up and put it into the top shelf. That would hurt after a while. That would, that could cause some pretty bad shoulder pain. that, that repetitive movement. And if, if, if that's the case, I'm pretty confident that we can do things to help you here, but let's, let's worry about your posture and your breathing. And, and if you're, shoulder hurts, if your shoulder is in excruciating pain, wouldn't it stand the reason that you're going to be a little hunched in like so to protect it? Well, yeah. So as we bring you into good posture, we're going to bring your shoulder back to that natural, comfortable position that we were all sitting or standing in when we were doing that deep breathing, that good alignment position. True story? Absolutely. So there are certainly mechanical reasons why that shoulder would hurt so badly. But there are also reasons like my friend from very early in my career, I don't know until we talk about it, until you tell me otherwise, how do, how do I know that you don't have a bullet fragment in your shoulder? I, I, now that I'm many, many more years into practice and have much more experience with all of this, I, I have an idea of what we can do for you even if there's a bullet fragment in your shoulder. I, I'm sorry, I should send this guy an apology note. I didn't know what to do for him 20 years ago. I know what to do for him now. So we're not... We're not chasing pain. We're not letting pain dictate how we treat. We're letting indicators in a person's body, how they present themselves, how their joints move, how toned are their muscles, how, how flexible are they, what are they eating, what medications might they be on, which nutritional supplements are they already taking, what's their mindset, what are their normal activities of daily living, and what are their hobbies. We're taking all of that and putting it into the funnel to figure out what exactly it is that we should be doing for them. So far, so good. IT Savant Phil. So far, so good. So not a big talker. This is, this is a lot for me, so I'm losing my voice. This is what's known as a shameless plug. I'm drinking a combination of the Pro Reds and the Power Fuel. I do another workshop on Wednesday, and we're going to overlap a lot of the things we talked about today, but instead of talking so much about rehab and talking about uh, um, drilling down on the technique, we're going to substitute in a lot more about the nutrition and how nutrition supports the techniques and the maneuvers and the things that I do in order to, to help my patients. So anyhow, um, on, a, on a personal note, I have a very, very close family member who's in a hospital right now. Now, look, I'm, my, my career is based on what are we going to do to prevent medication, drugs, surgeries, hospitalizations, but there's a time and a place. Let's not, let's not lose sight of that. I have a very close relative who is in a hospital right now for good reason. I went to go visit him, and every ache and pain that I have ever had flared up. Uh, um, environmental stimulus. Uh, I'm staring at, at my, my relative and man, my back starts hurting. That headache starts churning. My ankles and my knees are throbbing. My poor father is there holding onto the wall, trying not to fall. My, my aunt is, I just one look at her and you know, she's in agony. Where was the trauma? Who beat my body with a baseball bat, causing my knees, ankles, back, and neck to all hurt at once? Where's the physical component? That's the neurological component of, of pain. Your, your external environment can drive you into a pain state. You cool with that? So here's what I do. If you could, as a matter of fact, let's take a couple deep breaths first. What, I'm sorry, were you, did you want to say something? No, okay. Let's how about everybody sit up it straight into that, that really good... Shoulders are rolled back, head is up, long and tall in the abdomen and the torso. Big deep breath in through your nose. I'm going to hold, hold it again, hold it just a little bit more and blow out through your mouths. Again, big deep breath in through your nose. Hold, hold, hold again, hold some more and blow out through your mouths. 
One last time. Big deep breath in through your nose. Hold, hold, hold some more, hold again, and blow out through your mouths. All right. So, so let's say I take a string of dental floss and I tie a knot in it and I put it between my bottom two front teeth and somebody sitting in front of me catches the other end of the string of dental floss and they give me a hard, sustained pull. You're going to have a friction rub at my gum. It's going to bleed and it's going to hurt, right? No, that's pretty straightforward. My jaw is, the bottom part of my jaw is translating forward. And these muscles here up around the hinge of my jaw, not far from my temples, are clenching hard and they're pulling backwards. We're having this game of tug of war with this dental floss latched into my teeth, pulling this way. I don't want you to take my chin. I need that thing. So I'm pulling hard against you. And these muscles are very strong to chew. Some of the strongest muscles in the body when you think about strength of contraction and surface area and how small they are and yet what they're capable of. They're not designed to play tug of war. They're designed to chew. So if we are playing that game of tug of war, they're going to fatigue rather quickly. They're going to spasm. They're going to get irritated. And what's going to happen? They're going to impact my ability to open and close my mouth. My hinge of my jaw is going to hurt. And the whole thing is going to be a mess. You guys all cool with that? All right. So if we're going to fix it, we got to do three things. We got to get rid of the inflammation. That's a chemical process. That's where we start talking about nutrition. This is a teaser for what we're going to discuss on Wednesday. Tell you all about the appropriate nutrition that it would take to get rid of that inflammation. Now, in the meantime, I want you to think like this. Dr. O really likes fish oil and he really likes turmeric. So we're going to get rid of the inflammation. The second thing that has to happen is we got to maneuver the hinge of the jaw and we got to coax it back into its proper movement pattern and get the jaw to open and close the way it's supposed to after the way it's been fatigued by those muscles playing tug of war, which are not supposed to be able to do that. Third thing that has to happen, got to quit pulling on the dental floss. Otherwise, we're going to do the same thing over and over and over again and never reach any kind of successful resolution. Muscles, tendons, and the skeleton behave the exact same way. Muscles or a group of muscles or an action of muscles will tighten and they will spasm and they will pull in a direction that's disadvantageous for us. All of those muscles attach to tendons. The tendons are a lot like the dental floss. They're a fixed length. So the tendons, when you pull hard on them, they're, they're not going to stretch. They might inflame. They might be uh, uh, compromised due to the heavy torquing. They might become irritated. But one thing that they will not do is stretch to accommodate for the, exer uh, the, uh, the exertion coming from the pulling of the muscles. The other end of the tendon attaches to the skeleton, to a bone. Where two bones come together, we have a joint, and that's where the movement occurs. So a muscle becomes tight. It's pulling. It's exerting a greater force on the tendon. The tendon is compressing two bones into each other, not necessarily grinding a bone against the bone, but certainly limiting the ability to have full range of motion at the joint. And consequently, inflammation, swelling, metabolic debris is all building up. You guys all cool with that? All right, good. Now, here's the really cool part. This is the part that I'm going to bet my career on. In the space between bones, at a joint, we have a, neuro, a population of neurological tissue called receptors, specifically joint mechanoreceptors. Receptors receive and transmit information. So if the joints are open all the way and they're able to move through a full range of motion, we're going to send information into the brain that tells the brain that, look, we got free, easy, complete range of motion. We're in good shape here. Feel free to produce some natural endorphins, some encephalons, some of the stuff that makes us feel really good. 
if those joints are compromised, if we have that scenario where the joint is unable to move through its full range of motion and, and uh, the muscles are torquing or pulling in a heavy direction, limiting that from happening, and we have spasm and inflammation and metabolic debris building up, we're going to lose that feedback into the brain. And the brain is, instead of producing endorphins and encephalons and feeling good, the brain's going to go on a hunt. The brain is going to start to try and find the body in space and start to look for feedback from other places. So the most amount of neurological activity, the brain's biggest output of energy and exertion deals with finding the body in space and keeping the eyes level with the horizon. So if we have all of this input from joints throughout the whole body from head to toe, sending messages into the brain to say, here I am, you don't have to go searching for me. You can produce natural endorphins and natural encephalons and we can feel good and we can move through a full range of motion and be comfortable with our status. If we have that going on, now the brain can use other forms of output to dictate what other organ function should do. Heart rate, that's a neurological phenomenon. Blood pressure, the ability to digest and absorb your food. All of these metabolic processes. Our ability to have this conversation and understand one another is a series of brain chemistry. Brain chemistry fueled by many, many, many different nutrients, oxygen being near the top of the list or at the top of the list. So. If we are able to have good full range of motion, if we are able to have relaxed, uh, uh, flexible muscles, if we're able to prevent our bodies from building up systemic inflammation due to joint mechanoreceptor uh, um, quietude, we could, we could be in pretty good shape. We could cruise through life with a relatively, I don't wanna say pain-free, but certainly diminished pain experience because our brain is keeping us feeling, our body feeling good. Now, these mechanoreceptors, also found in muscles, also found in tendons, also found in ligaments. Ligaments connect bone to bone, tendons connect muscle to bone. So when I tell you from a chiropractic perspective, from a clinical perspective, I'm looking at ways of helping people breathe deeper. I'm looking at ways of of creating greater ranges of motion, better posture, better balance, better ability to orient and find your body in space. We're working on the whole body. So our, our hypothetical patient who came in with that excruciating shoulder pain, how, we haven't even determined whether there's a problem with their shoulder or is the shoulder a symptom of some other body part gone awry. And, and that's why I favor treatments that one, we do that trigger point therapy to address muscles. We do that proprioceptive neurofacilitated PNF stretching in order to address mostly tendons, but also muscle tendon joints. And we do chiropractic adjustments to uh, uh, maneuver joints and to get those mechanoreceptor pools to fire the way that they're supposed to in a, in a more complete population versus allowing them to sit there dormant because of the uh, uh, compressive nature of the tight pulling of of spasm muscles. So far so good? So we have these strategies in place to excite the brain. We have uh, um, these strategies in place that are gonna raise what's called the frequency of firing of the central integrative state, the central integrative state being brain function. But we have bad stuff that happens too. We have uh, an entirely different population of receptors called nociceptors. Nociceptors uh, uh, signal harm, that something has gone awry. When the nociceptors fire, when the nociceptors become active and they start to uh, um, um, communicate more with the brain, we start to feel pain. We start to feel discomfort. So we have this hypothetical patient that we haven't even determined if they have a nociceptive input coming from their shoulder to their brain or if the shoulder hurts as a symptom of something else. We haven't even figured that out yet, but we know for certain of this, 
we know that based on the way that that person's brain is firing, they are perceiving pain in their shoulder. Still so far so good? Excellent. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that these nociceptors don't get a chance to fire. And if they do fire, we want to have mechanisms to shut them off. So what is it that would cause a nociceptor to fire and tell the brain to start experiencing pain? Well, one is tissue destruction. If I hit my hand on the table long enough and hard enough, it's going to start to hurt because I'm probably going to start to bruise the tissue here in the knife edge of my hand where I'm making physical contact with the table and I'm, I'm, I'm repetitively damaging it. I'm creating tissue damage. I'm getting nociceptors to fire. Now, when you think about the cumulative effect, all these nociceptors that are starting to fire from the knife edge of my hand and tell my brain that I should be experiencing pain right here, they might also be telling my brain that I should be experiencing pain in other places in my body. And if I've had a past injury to my shoulder, which we still haven't figured out what's going on there yet, and we haven't figured out an appropriate treatment plan, it's very possible that, that this shoulder could start to hurt in our hypothetical patient because of a repetitive impact to their hand. That's why taking a history is so important and figuring out not only what's going on with you in the moment, but what's going on with you in the past. Have you injured that body part before? No, and it just started hurting all of a sudden. That's very different than somebody who's had a previous injury to that uh, same body part from a, what, what are we going to do to ensure clinical success and, and help you as much as we can. Once again, reds and power fuel. Delicious. What else causes these nociceptors to fire? pH, our acid base uh, uh, continuum. Our bodies become too acidic. We can start triggering nociceptors to fire, signaling our brain that we should be in pain. So if I'm eating McDonald's four days a week, it would be a safe bet that my body would be pretty acidic, wouldn't it? There are not enough alkalinizing green superfoods out there to counterbalance four meals a week at McDonald's. So if I'm sitting here living in a body that I very irresponsibly turned into an acidic machine, what, what's going to happen? I'm going to start to experience aches and pains. And, and I say, why is it that my, my, I've been basically lying still and doing so little. And now my, my elbows have started to hurt and my shoulders hurt and my knees hurt. Why, why is that? Well, remember that pain is a systemic phenomenon. It's, it's a neuroemotional phenomenon. I don't need to hit my elbows and my knees and my shoulders to have pain in my elbows, knees, and shoulders. I need to fire off a nociceptor population. And, and that can happen through, uh, uh, through having a poor pH continuum where we've shifted too far acidic and not alkaline or basic enough. Uh, what else can cause nociceptors to fire? Well, too much mechanical pressure, not enough mechanical pressure. So if I take my fist and I just whoom, as hard as I can and I hit this table here, that's a lot of mechanical pressure moving at a pretty high speed and it's probably going to hurt. What else could cause that too much mechanical pressure? Once again, just hitting it over and over and over and over again at a relatively gentle threshold. That could cause me to have my nociceptors begin to fire. Temperature. How many of you out there would say, man, I felt so good all summer long, and then the winter hit, and oh my God, my body just started hurting. That's a pretty common experience. And some people will tell you the opposite. They tell you, boy, am I comfortable in the winter? I love those Pittsburgh winters, but man, it becomes spring, summer. They dial up the temperature around here. My body just starts to hurt. Well, change in temperature can cause nociceptive activation. Poor, faulty, injured cell membranes. That's going to that's gonna go along with that pH change. But it also goes along with a nutrient deficiency. You guys ever hear of a electrolytes, that those drinks with minerals in it and uh, uh, little minute electrical charges? 
Gatorade, rich in electrolytes, very rich in sugar. Power fuel, very rich in electrolytes, not much sugar. So our neurological activity is based on electrochemical gradients. We have to have a certain electrical charge where we're going to be just, just slightly negative. And if we have that charge intact, we're going we're to be okay. But when that charge breaks down and it drifts too far negative or even too far positive, all of a sudden our cell membranes start to fail. Now, what's the significance of a cell membrane? Here's another teaser for you for uh, uh, Wednesday's talk. All of our uh, activity, all this activity that we talk about, whether it's digestion or cognitive thought, or uh, um, heart rate, all, all this is cellular stuff. It happens at the mi most minute layer. And every cell of the body has this tiny little fatty level layer around it for insulation and protection. Once again, just remember, Dr. Orbach likes fish oil and turmeric. We're going to talk more about that on Wednesday. But if the cell membranes become faulty because they don't have enough fish oil to support regeneration, uh, or other appropriate nutrients to support regeneration, or we don't have the right uh, uh, electrolytes to maintain our chemical charge and our balances and our imbalances, the cell membrane starts to disappear, to deteriorate, and debris starts to leak out. When that debris starts to leak out, guess what? We start to activate those same nociceptors, and we start to experience systemic pain. So far, so good. All right. So it sounds like it sounds like we're kind of at a disadvantage. And if you study the 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 nervous system and you study the the city of system of checks and balances and you figure out well what are what are the circumstances which we could be in pain and what are the circumstances that we can get out of pain and what are the circumstances that we can prevent pain in the first place the simple truth of the matter is we're designed to be in pain all the time and we're able to suppress that in, in many occasions, maybe even most occasions for most people. So that, that mechanoreceptor, the good stuff that lives in our muscles and our connective tissue and our joints, what it does is when it fires, it inhibits the nociceptive transmissions to the brain. Now, I think back to my patient who was shot in the S-bone, should have never been messing around with his lower back. We should have been looking at other strategies. Where are we going to bombard his brain with mechanoreceptor afferents? Afferents means message to the brain. Efferent means message away from the brain. How are we going to get mechanoreceptor afferents to uh, um, stimulate his brain? Well, fortunately for him, I did study with uh, Ken Erickson and Ted Carrick and uh, uh, the Motion Palpation Institute under the direction of Mark King and Mark Charette. So we never did any adjusting on his lower back. I'm not going to be the guy who moves that bullet lodged in his S-bone somewhere else where it could cause real harm. Instead, we did adjustments with his neck, his upper back, his feet. We did stretching techniques with his shoulders, very, very little bit with his hips because they were so anatomically close to the, to the bullet. And look, I'm not going to tell you that we got him to be completely pain-free, but we certainly got him headed in the right direction, and he certainly would have been one of the guys to smile brightly and leave the office feeling like there actually was hope and uh, uh, were able to help him quite a great deal. Um, so we want to make sure that we're firing off mechanoreceptors, and we don't want to – we don't want to um, – fire mechanoreceptors from one place and one place only. We want to use the whole body as a tool to start stimulating the brain using the neurological cascade of events that occurs when we do treatment to the feet, when we do treatment to the knees, to the shoulders, as a tool to uh, uh, enhance what we're doing or to stimulate what we're doing or upgrade what we're doing to the spine. Or maybe we want to use spinal treatments to upgrade and to enhance the treatments that we're doing with shoulders, with knees, with elbows. And, and when, we're, when we're able to do that, when we're able to treat those patients, 
more comprehensively and we're able to address people from head to toe, that's where it gets really exciting. And that's where we stand a chance, not only to be able to get our patients to breathe deeper, to have better posture, to have better balance, to live more comfortably in their bodies, but we can also do a great deal to help them get out of pain and enjoy life as it was meant to be. So with that in mind, I want to thank everybody for their super kind attention. And I want to thank everybody who participated in my low tech rehab exercise, doing the deep breathing. Um, the floor is open. If there are any questions, comments, moral outrages, or anything like that. Let's see. My people are enthusiastic, but silent and that's okay. Yes. The question is, I have a friend who has Parkinson's. Is there anybody who has success with that? And, and Park, Parkinson's, Parkinson's is a very difficult disease to treat. And, and what we hope to do with, with Parkinson's is slow down the progression. And, and there's certainly, there certainly nutritional supplements, coenzyme Q10, uh, B complex vitamins, fish oil, the proprietary blend that Nutritional Frontiers puts out called Brain Boost, that, that certainly we would want to feed to our Parkinson's patients. And we also want to make sure that those people, we want to rewire their brain and you rewire their brain through activity. It's called neuroplasticity. Now, when I do a chiropractic adjustment or when I stretch somebody's joints and muscles, we're making what are called neuroplastic changes in the way their brain is receiving information. And so with Parkinson's patients, the most important neuro neuro neuroplastic changes that they can make is through exercise. So I really like to see my Parkinson's population of people going for a walk every day. So critically important. And when they walk, what I want them to do is over-exaggerate their arm swing. For example, when you step forward with your left foot, your right arm should swing forward, right? It's called cross-crawl. So we want to see those Parkinson's people really over-exaggerate the arm swing uh, uh, with each step. Uh, in order to stimulate more areas of the brain. And that cross crawl is, is it's an old neurological pattern. I mean, the, uh, the, ability, the ability to breathe, the ability to have control your heart rate, that's, that's old brain. I mean, when we think about how old we are as a species, the ability to uh, uh, speak in intelligible language, that's a relatively new phenomenon. We were existent as a species without spoken language for a very long time. So with Parkinson's patients, you want to excite the oldest sections of the brain with that, with that cross crawl type of walk. And I do actually have a number of Parkinson's patients that I do very general adjustments with. So yeah, there, there are things that we can do. I don't want to mislead you and tell you that we can make it go away. We can, we can slow the progression. And anything else out in tech land? I know. All right. Well, once again, I want to thank you all for your very kind attention. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for taking your deep breaths. Thank you for promising to do your deep breathing exercises multiple times every day. And uh, Wednesday, we're going to do something very similar, but not identical. We're going to do a much greater focus on the, uh, um, the systemic nutrition that goes along with uh, um, everything that I do.